David Berselli, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. And thank you very much, Howie. Nice to be here and good to see you again. Yeah, I've, I've been looking forward to this for, I think it's been over two years. <laughs> oh, great. It finally came. Yeah. So it's funny because we were talking about doing a recording um, and then I was off to South Africa and then like all hell broke loose around the world. And then you, you, you got out. I didn't. And, I know. I just got out on the last flight. Actually, I got out back to the States and it was packed with people. So I got uh -huh. out just before the shutdown of uh, South Africa. Yeah, I ended up getting out on a State Department flight. Oh really? That, uh, because every, every everything else was uh, was was booked. All the yeah. we were trying to get out on KLM and Turkish Airlines, and finally the U.S. government just uh, chartered something. So we we were the only people in the entire airport. It was very eerie. Oh really? Oh that's interesting. Yeah, that was quite an interesting time. Actually, I'm glad I was there to experience that because it gave you the sense that something's going on globally. Mm. Were, you, were you doing uh, work there or just on vacation? Yeah, I was doing, I was supposed to be there for four weeks, I think it was. I ended up being there just for two because when I go to South Africa, I go to many different places in South Africa so I can do as many workshops as possible. Gotcha. So, I mean, for you, the way, you know, knowing about your, your biography and your backstory, um, you know, a COVID lockdown is not anywhere near the kinds of things you're typically, you know, asked to help with. No, COVID was kind of easy for me. I just didn't want to get stuck in South Africa. That was my only thing, although I love South Africa. But usually it's war, mortar shells, you know, somebody shooting weapons, bombs, all that stuff. Yeah, all right. Remind me not to go on vacation with you. <laughs> right? I've invited a few people and they have declined. <laughs> You're like the main character in like Murder, She Wrote or something like wherever the sweet little lady shows up. Yes, it's almost always the case. Either I arrive there just before there's an explosion or right after there's an explosion of some sort. So yeah, yeah that's my life. So, so that's, that's probably a decent segue into the actual, into the work you do, um, which is helping people release trauma that's been stuck in their bodies. Yeah, very much so. Actually, and I learned it in war, actually, when I was living in uh, places like South Sudan, Lebanon, mm -hmm. Israel, a few places, yeah. Yeah, so let's start, let's start at the beginning, because I, I just re-listened to an interview that you did with um, uh, the um, Ruth, um, blanking on her last name, from the, the mental health, um, uh, NICABM. I do a lot of interviews. Yeah. Well, you were, you know, she's asking you like, what, you know, what were you doing in South Sudan and Lebanon? And you were, you were already, you were doing, um, you know, basically whatever you could to provide services to uh, women and children whose men were off fighting. Where, where did that, like, where did that start? I was working with a nonprofit organization and they sent me to various places to literally to help people um, who were civilians and who were surviving either poverty or severe stress situations, political violence or war. So I was working mostly with refugees and with poor people in particular. And mm -hmm. so there were many times when I was in situations of bombings and shootings and all that stuff. And um, I recognized that when we're talking about trauma now, we're not just talking about like we do in what we call the Western world where one person is traumatized and you go to therapy for two years and you work it out with your therapist. When you've got political violence, natural disasters, poverty, you're talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of people. So the paradigm of trauma recovery was basically shattered in my mind. Everything I had studied in my doctoral program was broken. It didn't work in these situations. And so then the question became, if this is real, if millions of people are being traumatized, what can we do? What type of method or procedure can we follow that helps millions of people and not just a couple people or a few hundred people? We're talking about tens of thousands, basically entire nations. And so with that break in the paradigm, it allowed my mind to have to think outside 
the boundaries. And so what happened was I was in a bomb shelter and in this bomb shelter, um, during the time of the bombing, we were crowded in there. I was holding two kids, young boys on my lap, two years old, and I had my hands on their backs to try to comfort them. And I could feel in my hands that they were actually shivering, tremoring like they were cold, but it was hot as could be, so it wasn't cold. They were shivering out of terror. And so I was fascinated by that because I knew at two years old, their body was following some sort of endogenous natural process. Mm -hmm. So when I looked around the bomb shelter, I noticed that all of these young children were all shivering like this. By the time they got to be about nine, 10 or 11, getting close to teenage years, you could see they were shaking, but they were trying to inhibit it. And then when I looked at the adults, absolutely none of them were shaking at all. And just that visual, the, the sort of a light bulb went off in my head and I thought, oh my God, these younger children are showing us what a natural response to trauma is. And the adults are completely dissociated or frozen from it. They were completely numb. So that when we left the bomb shelter and I asked the adults, I said, do you ever shake like the children do? They said, no, we don't shake like that because we don't want them to think we're afraid. And mm. that was the magic moment when I thought, you've learned how to inhibit that. And how we, I, I equated it with crying. If you're two years old and you fall and you hurt your knee, you cry freely. If you're nine, 10 or 11 and you fall and you hurt your knee, you try not to cry. You deliberately try not to cry. And by the time you're adults, you can't cry. Your diaphragm, your chest cavity are so contracted, you could actually break your leg and not cry. So what we, what we do is we train ourselves out of what's called endogenous or um, inter, internal rhythms that the body uses. And tremoring in fear is one of those internal rhythms that the body should be able to activate anytime we elevate the nervous system, it actually tremors itself to calm the nervous system back down. Mm. And I'm wondering, you know, as, as I heard that story, like it was really telling to me that they said, we don't want the children to see us crying because it will make them afraid. I didn't buy that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether you, whether you do or whether it was a story they were telling themselves because well, the, the truth was. You, why don't you buy it, Howie? I'm curious. Because I think that even if there were no kids there, they wouldn't be tremoring. It's the it's their own selves that they don't want to see. You oh, know, so it's I, like the, the I would agree with that too, actually. Once you've learned how to stop those natural processes, you simply do it, even if you're a group of adults. A group of adults will not cry amongst each other, um, whether there's no children there or not, because we Imagine what we call crying is weakness, vulnerability, fear. It's mm. every negative response possible, even tremoring in the body. You're frightened. You're, um, you're unable to control yourself. That's a big thing for our culture. Um, so yes, I think all of those out of control experiences that we would have as children naturally, we learn to dissociate from those as adults. And then we live in these rather numb and dissociated mm. bodies. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, work I did many, many years ago um, based on the work of Wilhelm Reich, who was talking about like pretty basically similar things like the body has these natural physiological responses. And he was speaking specifically of uh, what he called the orgasm response, which is sort of these natural uh, flows of energy throughout the body that are uninhibited. And I'm curious how you connect that. Like once, once I'm locked up and I can't tremor, in response to a trauma, or I didn't tremor in response to a trauma and it's still in there, does that impact my ability, my body's ability to be um, spontaneous in other ways? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it does. If you could imagine a supple, soft body, it can move, it's flexible, everything's working fine in it. And then you start to squeeze the structure. 
So you're squeezing mostly along the spinal column, you know, shoulder girdle, pelvic girdle. You start to squeeze the structure right there. That squeezing, and this is for sports people too, when they do their strengthening stuff, that interrupts a more natural uh, pulsating flow in the human body. And you compound those by 30, 50 different experiences that you had in life, just being angry at your spouse or partner or friend or whatever, <clears throat> being in a car accident, even if it's a minor one where you're just shocked by the, uh, um, the hitting of the cars, all of those things create these little patterns that initially might even be undetectable. You might go to a chiropractor, get rid of them, et cetera. But underneath, there's this pattern that probably has not released um, and that's what this tremor mechanism does. And that's what I think Reich and Lowen were talking about when they were talking about the organ reflex. Um, <clears throat> and a Alexander Lowen talks about the energetic flow of the body. They're talking about every contraction that we've experienced in life. If we did not have a capacity to uh, release that into a, back into a natural flow, it is still there. And that goes as early as people being uh, going through the birth canal, because I've worked with many people in TRE who actually you could watch their bodies going back through the birth canal. That's how well the body retains the physical sensation it experiences in life. Mm. Now, in, in some of your work, I've seen clips of like nature scenes like animals in nature, you know, the, the stag escaping, gazelles escaping from the lion and naturally tremoring. So like, it, it's, it seems to me a basic mammalian trait. It's exactly that. It's a mammal trait, which we still possess. So my theory is if we still possess it, that means we still need it in, in our evolutionary process. And the one thing that's interesting, mammals in the wild who are actually at life or death threat every day do not experience post-traumatic stress disorder. So that, that implies that what happens when they do have a stressful event and they escape from it, they run away and their body just tremors and it tremors out that contraction and the high adrenal um, chemical reaction that happens during stress that all gets dissipated just by tremoring. But see, animals will tremor maybe for half an hour or so. Much like you see a dog tremoring in a thunderstorm. That's actually very mm. healthy for it. It's reducing its stressor. Huh. I, I remember um, sort of dog sitting for a dog who didn't know me and that we had a thunderstorm and they, the owners gave us a pill to, you know, if he looks agitated, give him the pill. So we were actually doing harm. It's, it's the worst thing in the world. Our medical system does the same thing. They medicate you to stop the tremors. And the tremors are the very thing that's bringing your body back to a calm and relaxed state. It fascinates me that we've missed this amazing primitive mechanism that's still genetically encoded in us. We should be exploring it neurologically and physiologically. What is its value? Rather than seeing as it's the body is out of control, therefore take medication to put it back into control. And basically we anesthetize the nervous system. All those meds anesthetize the nervous system, which stops the tremor as does alcohol actually, but it only stops it temporarily, see. Hmm. So are, are there, you know, you've done work around the world. Um, I have a picture in my head of sort of um, indigenous populations as having more wisdom than we do and being more communal and more attuned to the repair needs of individuals. Are there civilizations around the world where tremoring was part of the healing process, where it was encouraged? And it's interesting. Yes, there are places, but not from a Western neurophysiological perspective. It came out of a spiritual perspective. And here's what happened. People would tremor and they did it mostly in some sort of ritual or ceremony. Tremoring was seen as very, very natural. And South Africa has a number of populations, different um, tribes there, where tr tremoring is done in a ritual way. It's either a Holy Spirit coming into a person or a bad spirit leaving the person. Hmm. Now, I like that because 
when there, you're talking about a small community of a social structure, you need to have some sort of process where um, a person who might be disrupting the social structure can go through a process where that negativity can leave them. Or if you have a wisdom figure in the social structure, that's evidence that they are in connection to something beyond themselves. They've never done it in the sense of letting go of fear, except in ritual and ceremony. And that's sort of the context that they put it in because they don't have neurophysiological training or understanding about it. But it is exactly the same thing. I've watched them tremor like that. And I couldn't tell the difference between that and what I do in TRE. Mm -hmm. Now, in, uh, in the natural, you know, when we're looking at um, a gazelle, like it happens on schedule, sort of like as soon as, as soon as it's safe enough to not be hypervigilant, like, is there a cost to waiting till the, till the next ritual or till they meet yeah. you 20 years later or listen to the this cost, podcast? Yeah, you're right. The cost to waiting, Howie, is that that pattern that was developed temporarily at the time of the fear to help you survive the, the threatful event, that pattern is brand new. The sooner you can get to releasing it, the easier that's going to be. But if you hold it on for several years, it now becomes part of the whole pattern of the structure of the body so that you, your body has adjusted itself to live around that pattern. And then that becomes a little bit more complex and a little bit more difficult to get out. Not impossible. It just may take many more times to do it. Um, <clears throat> and great example of this is many TRE people who've been doing TRE for years and have a regular tremoring session once a week or so, they've been in minor car accidents. And they knew right afterwards, when they would come home and they'd lay down in bed or on the floor, their body would begin to tremor automatically. And they could feel the very pattern the body had just created to survive the car accident was releasing. And they said they got rid of it within a day. Hmm. Uh, are, are there other... Um culturally sanctioned ways that we have of tremoring i'm thinking about you know rock concerts and raves and right like, you know where 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 you know there's this great physiological need that somehow we we can't escape fully well we've been trained to be in control but the issue with that is is that our body is both um, designed to control and let go of control See, we don't have as many opportunities to let go of control. That's why when somebody goes to a rave or a concert, they explode because hmm. there's so much in there that they're so, their body literally is desperate to get it all out. But the one thing that's kind of interesting, if you go to a, um, um, a, a, a fair where they've got like all these roller coaster rides and stuff like that, people will ride them over and over and over because what happens, before they get on the ride, they can feel, oh my God, I'm starting to shake, I'm starting to shake. So they're actually playing with this. <clears throat> they get on the roller coaster ride, they shake on the roller coaster, and then when they get off, they're all laughing at each other. Oh, look at my leg shaking, look at my leg shaking. Oh my God, that was wild. And it's the same sense that that tremoring that we do in play when safety is present is actually very, uh, exciting and fun and releasing. And so we enjoy it actually. Hmm. I love that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the physiology. So talk about like the, the first stage, uh, the first moment of a traumatic threat, the perception of threat is turtling or what you call going to the fetal position. Right. Okay. Right. So the body by its very nature, knows to protect the underbelly for any threat at all. So it starts to squeeze. And we know that the psoas muscle is instrumental in that. That's called the fight or flight muscle. And that's in the pelvis. So it squeezes the body forward. Okay. So what that means is it elongates the back of, excuse me, the back of the spine, see? And so even if it's just an eighth of an inch, a very small bit, you've just changed um, not just the anatomy of the structure, but the neurological communication going on in the spine, as an example. 
And so now you have reduced communication or interrupted communication, which is what's creating like lower back pains, which most people suffer from all over the world, or neck or shoulder pains. Those are so common. And that's because the spinal column has been interrupted. It's been disturbed in some way. And then that doesn't come out. So now the shoulders adjust themselves to pull forward and the spine adjusts itself to lean a little bit forward. And the whole anatomy of the structure gets distorted. Hmm. I'm thinking about uh, the opposite posture, is all, which is also rigid, is sort of a military, military posture. Is that a kind of a, a try to hyper response to? Yeah. So I work with a lot of military and you're right. And I was in the military myself. You're supposed to stand up straight, push the chest out and pull the shoulders back. Well, that's not a normal position. And so that does the same thing. It distorts the structure. What that usually does from what I've seen is it freezes the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles between the ribs. So the whole chest cavity in a sense gets stuck in an inhaled position since all the ribs are connected to the spine, now you've got the spinal column interrupted one more time, and now you've got this hyperextended position of the structure, which once again, simply distorts it from its natural breathing and pulsation. We're, we should see ourselves more like amoebas than anything else. We should see ourselves as pulsating, and we don't. We see rigidity or expansion as the, the best state for the body to be in, but it also needs to collapse and let go. So the healthiest state of the human body is when it can pulsate, when it can go into the soldier stance, it can go into the fetal response, and then it can go back to normal. That would be the healthiest rhythm for the structure. Mm. Okay. So, so the, the, the fetalization, depending on the threat, you know, only lasts a, a, sh a very short time, right? Because we will, most, you know, it's, it, fetalization is not part of fight or flight. It may be part of fold or even freeze. Right. Um, but so then we, so we have that initial fetalization response, which I, I assume sort of pumps the blood into the extremities and then prepares us for, for active evasion or if necessary fight. Um, then what happens? After, after the danger is over. Yeah, well, after the danger is over, the body should be able to go back to its normal state. But it's sort of like this. If you think of, you've squeezed the psoas muscles very tight, you've increased the adrenaline in the body. That's why if you, even if you've just been angry with somebody, you had a big fight, hours later, you can still find yourself tight in your belly or in your psoas. And you just say, ah, oh, I just feel, I'm not calm inside. No, this is hours after the, the fight was over. You're not calm inside because everything is still tight and tense. You think you've released it, but it hasn't let go. And we think we release it just because we get up and we start walking away. But deeper inside that tissue, the release has not yet occurred. That's why it's still there. And unfortunately, Howard, we live or we sit in chairs, mostly for our jobs, eight hours a day, which is keeping the body in a fetal response. Now the mm. torso isn't being pulled forward, but the psoas muscle is contracted right now in both of us as though we're in a fetal response. Hmm. Wow, I never thought about that. But, uh, so ch ch chairs essentially infantilize us. In some degree. Exactly right. And this is why lower back pain, lumbar pain is the most common pain of all uh, um, skeletal um, pains uh, in this country, at least in this country. And it's the biggest, it's, it's the highest complaint among military personnel is lumbar pain. Mm -hmm. So if, if I then don't go through the, the tremoring process, which I guess is, you know, releases and you've, you've looked at like, what are the muscles involved right there? They're the same muscles that fetalize that initiate the tremor, right? Yes, but not just those muscles. That's just part of it. Every muscle group and fascia pattern that's connected to that also over time becomes affected. That's why when you tremor, the tremoring, you could do the exercises, but then the tremors go down the legs right into your feet and into your toes as an example. 
and somebody's mm. tremoring in their feet and they've never did, did it, no exercise or anything like that. The tremor mechanism is following the pattern of the fascia and the muscle all the way to its conclusion of release. Gotcha. So what's the connection between the, uh, the stuck trauma when we don't tremor and our psychological and emotional states? Because you could think of it, okay, so I've, I've solved this, like I've had this argument with someone and I let go of it, because you know, but I can't let go of it, right? right? Is, is it like, you know, like, like so much of, of like, you know, behavioral cognitive therapies are about changing your thoughts. Is it like our thoughts are anchored to these physiological states that we haven't addressed? Yeah, what we are still missing is that we are a neurophysiological organism. And so the structure can cause a change in the neural patterns and the neural patterns can cause a change in the structure. So when you say I let go of it, but it's still haunting you, that means you haven't let go of it. Some place there's a pattern directly associated with that in the body. There's a pattern in the body that's associated with the thought that you're not able to let go of. Years later, if you really were able to let go of it, it wouldn't be in existence in the sense of still being alive in your structure or in the neural pathways. It would be a memory that you could still have but wouldn't evoke an emotional state or a physiological change in you. You just say, yeah, that was when this happened. Uh-huh. So one of the things I, I think I understand about trauma is that when we are experiencing tra uh, trauma, we're not remembering it, but we're experiencing it as if it was happening now. So is that when, because the body is still in that response? Is that why that happens? Well, post-traumatic stress is precisely that the body is still living in the guarded state that it took at the time of the trauma that hasn't released. And so it continues to stay alive in the individual. Um, and this, again, soldiers are a perfect example of that. When they come back from having been overseas in war, and if a car backfires or you just slam a door, they startle and immediately go into a fight or flight response. <clears throat> they know they don't want to, but they can't stop the organism from immediately trying to protect them from something that they can even see is not dangerous. It tells you all of that's still alive inside the structure, not just in their brain. They're not just psychologically um, having difficulties. There's a physiological component which we completely overlook. Mm. And so it seems like when we overlook it, all of the therapies that we use to try to address them at, at best are neutral, but probably are doing harm because they're making people feel like, what's wrong with me? Why, I know this is the wrong thought to have and yet I can't stop having it. Well, okay, so I have a lot of military people and this is a common example of it. They come back, they do counseling or therapy because they can feel something's wrong inside of themselves. Oftentimes that just is a re-triggering of the event because they're telling the story and that sort of stuff. And so what soldiers do as a way to try, because they can feel there's something wrong inside their bodies. They end up going to gyms excessively, uh, lifting weights and doing all sorts of gymnastics and stuff to sort of try to figure out how to work their body. And what we're not realizing is that it is an absolutely impossibility for the human organism to heal simply neurologically or simply physiologically. We are designed that they are both connected and communicating to each other. So the field of psychology, um, who was it? Um, Bessel van der Kolk made a statement probably about seven or eight years ago. He's a big trauma therapist. He said, you will never heal trauma without accessing the body as well. And because he was a, he's a psychotherapist. He, actually, I think he's a, he's a neurologist, I believe. Anyways. He came to the conclusion, which really upset the, the field of counseling. He came to the conclusion that you have to do body work or you're not going to heal the trauma. Now, mm -hmm. he uses yoga as his form of body work, but he did make that connection. And that's our problem. Still today, we treat the field of psychology separate from the field of physiology. Um, and so then we train people separately in these fields 
Whereas true healing is when we combine both of those and the organism can now communicate within itself its own neurophysiological patterns. Mm. Now, one of the things that I love about your work is that it is by, by force so, so easily accessible because you had to teach thousands of people with whom you did not share a language because I've seen, you know, th there's a whole movement around, so, you know, like somatic experiencing Peter Levine. I've watched Peter Levine's videos of him working with people. And you know, I'm, I'm just in awe of his discernment and his mastery. And part of the part of what I'm thinking is, boy, I, I don't know, I could never do that. And you have something that pretty much anyone could do. <laughs> Well, that was, again, another one of my challenges, because I love Peter Levine's work as well. It's very precise and very exact, and um, <clears throat> you can be trained to do it, et cetera. But once again, it's more one-on-one -on -one situations. Like I said, my paradigm of that was broken when I was living in war. This came from a Sudanese woman um, in southern Sudan when I was there. And I just flew in on this Piper Cub into this really remote area and was trying to help this one village, you know, recover from trauma. And this one woman, she was a mother and she came up to me just as I got off the plane and she said, if you are here to tell us how traumatized we are, we don't need you. We've already hmm. been told that. If you're here to show us a way to get out of it, you're welcome to be here. And that was very, very humbling. And it was very powerful. Thank God I had TRE. So I told her, yes, I'm going to teach you how to do this technique. My goal from meeting this woman was to teach every mother, uh, particularly mothers who might be, un, um, their husbands or sons might have been killed in war or whatever, to teach them how to help their children to recover from trauma even if they only have an eighth grade education. I had to make it that simple and that accessible. And so what I would do is I would start working with these mothers and I would tell them <clears throat> how to do this for themselves, how to work with each other. And sometimes I only had 10 days to two weeks, that was it. But all I had to do is keep them tremoring over and over and over. And the tremoring got to them. That is what was telling them that they were healing, not my theories. Hmm. So when you first developed this, what did it look like? How, you know, how, how hard was it? How simple? How did you figure out what exercises? There's so many different ways to get at these muscles. Yeah, I used a lot of it was hit and miss for about five years. I was trying to play with everything. So I used some bioenergetic, some some Asian uh, Tai Chi moves, some yoga things. But I, the other sort of insight that I got was when I worked with a group of what's called the Lost Boys of Sudan. And these were young boys who ran for months and months and months away from being shot or killed. So they were called the Lost Boys. And when I was working with them, it was so interesting. You know, one of the exercises is to turn onto the outside and inside of your foot, meaning turn your feet back and forth like this, okay? Uh -huh. And in that exercise, I showed it to them, and here's what they did. They turned both their feet to the outside or both their feet to the inside. Even though they watched what I was doing, they couldn't imitate it. And I realized, oh my God, these boys have trauma all the way down into their feet so that there is not a neurological connection to see what I'm doing and to be able to imitate that. They couldn't do it. And that's when I realized that trauma <clears throat> starts from the feet and goes all the way up to the psoas muscle. That's the primary region where the trauma ana anatomically is located in the structure because we're talking about it, a fight or flight response, okay? And so then I began to do exercises for every muscle group from the feet up to the waist. And that's how I put it together. At the, initially, it was a little complicated, a little hard. And then I started making it easier and easier because I know a lot of traumatized people have physical limitations. So now it's gotten almost to the point, Howard, where they just have to do the last exercise, laying on the floor and picking up their pelvis and they can access it. I'm still trying to look mm -hmm. to shorten it but still keep it effective. 
Mm -hmm. So, so literally, if I'm lying down on the ground on my back, my feet are on the ground, so my knees are up in the air, and I just lift my pelvis and wait. No, what you do is you lay down on the ground and you go into what's called the butterfly or the frog position in yoga. And that's where your knees are bent, but they fall over so that the bottoms of your feet are together. So you have okay. this little uh, V shape going on in the legs. So you hold that position and pick your pelvis up so that your knees are open and the bottoms of your feet are where you're using the pressure to help lift the pelvis up off the floor. So you do that to the degree that you can because people have physical limitations, et cetera. But you can go all the way, you can pick it up all the way to your shoulder. So you've got a huge arch in the torso. So your back is arched, your knees are open. Look how available you're making yourself. That's completely the opposite of the fetal response. The mm. knees are open. The pelvis is pushed into the air. The chest is arched out forward. That's exactly the opposite. And that's what seems to activate the tremor mechanism easiest. Hmm. So I'm imagining there's, there's not only the muscles being tired out, but there's also willing, willingly putting yourself in this position of great vulnerability. Right. And that's when you have to be careful because what if you're working with someone who's had sexual abuse, as an example, that could be too vulnerable to them. Then you'd have to adjust the exercises and things like that. But that shows you, again, there's a neurophysiological reaction. Because if I'm saying put yourself in this position physically, even if they've had sexual abuse in the past, I'm not doing anything in their brain, but that's being evoked in the brain by the physiological position. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to work with. Yeah. So for someone who is also, you know, trained in, in psychotherapy, might this be a way, because, you know, there's like all these movies are about someone finally having the memory breakthrough. Oh, that's what happened. And then they're cured right there. Right. Um, right. Which I, I don't know if it work, actually works that way, you know, in real life or like stories from Freud on the couch where the insight instantly heals someone. But is, is this a way of bringing people back to those moments so that they can process them as adults when maybe, you know, at, in the moment it was too overwhelming. So some part of them shut down and dissociated. Oh, that's exactly what it is. It, it, in, so in one sense, that tremor mechanism is just following what the tension pattern is inside the structure and trying to release it because that's, we're designed to, to use that tremor mechanism to restore pulsation back into the body, get rid of rigidity and tightness. When that starts to release a pattern, let's say it's a pattern that was released even in a sports injury, you broke your, your shoulder or something like that. Um, it releases, when it releases the shoulder, you say, oh my God, that was from like 12 years ago. I thought that was out of my body. I didn't realize I was still holding it. And I have that happen many, many times. They have the breakthrough awareness after the structure moves. So after the body moves itself through the process, and I say, well, why is your right shoulder shaking like that and your left shoulder isn't? Say, I don't know. After it resolves that, maybe even the next day, they'll phone me up and say, oh my God, now I realize why. So the body has a memory that's different than the memory that's just in our cognition. And science is demonstrating that they actually think that memory might be in fascia as much as it is in the neural pathways of the brain. So I think we're still quite primitive, honestly, in understanding the, the depth mm -hmm. of neurophysiological communication and connection that's going on. Well, it makes sense to me that memory is located in space, because when I you know, if I've listened to a podcast or a book on tape and I'm listening to it again, I'll remember where I was when I heard it the first time. Yeah, and even more so in a traumatic event. That's why it could bring all of that back. People, I have people who even smell anesthesia when they were in the hospital and they had to be operated on and anesthetized. They're laying on my, my floor and they're tremoring and all of a sudden they can feel maybe gagging because a tube had been put down their throat or they can tell you, I smell the anesthesia of the operation. All of that can still be very alive inside the body.
Hmm. And it's interesting because I, I was frustrated a couple of weeks ago because there were things I couldn't remember. I hurt my left foot. So I was going in for some, you know, evaluation and people were saying, well, have you in, you know, tell me about your injuries. I'm like, I have so many injuries. Like, I don't even remember all the injuries. Like, you know, the, like I was a kid, I would fall down, you know, hit my coccyx or something. But like, I don't know. I, yeah, I think I sprained this ankle more than that one. Just saying like the body itself is where the repository is and where the trustworthy information is. If I can start doing things that allow my body to express themselves, yeah, that's all accessible. I, that's a great phrase. The repository information is still inside the structure. And there are many people who have great releases and they say, I have no idea what that comes from, but wow, it feels great <laughs> that it's gone. Uh -huh. so you it might not even have a memory attached to it any longer, but usually I think that means they've resolved the memory in the neural pathways so that it doesn't exist there any longer, but they didn't resolve it in the tissue yet. And then when that releases, the whole body feels more alive. Hmm. Now, as, as a generalization, men, the, the man project is much about much more about control and not showing weakness than the woman project, do you see a difference, gender difference in how people huge, hold trauma? Huge difference. First of all, women let go faster. They have to follow natural rhythms. They have a monthly cycle. They birth children. They're more familiar, more comfortable with having to let go of their bodies. They're, they're, the nature of being female forces them to learn how to let go and to regain control and let go and regain control. So they have a more natural pulsation built into their, their rhythm of life. And men don't have that. And like you said, we were designed to be the protectors. We have more testosterone, more adrenaline in the bodies. We're supposed to be protectors. And so that means being rigid, being hard, um, be, being able to get angry is part of that so that you can fight and defend. And, but we have equated all of those qualities of woman or female of letting go and crying and pulsating and giving into your nature. We've equated all of that with weakness, see? And so we do have a great deal of difficulty and this is just about every country in the world that I've seen where men have more difficulty being flexible, soft, gentle, et cetera, um, uh, much more problem with that than women do. Mm. Um, so for folks who want to know more and start doing this themselves beyond the, the description that you gave, where can they learn more about, uh, T and t what is TRE? You've said, you've said the acronym a few times, what does it stand for? Yeah, TRE stands for Tension and Trauma Releasing Exercises. Okay. And what that basically is, is just the exercises themselves are a way to activate this tremor mechanism, which really resets your nervous system, releases tension in the structure and calms down the nervous system. And um, so you, there are two places you can go. You can go to traumaprevention.com, which is the official website, if they want to see examples of this from around the world, go to my YouTube channel, which is simply David Verselli. I've got about 200 videos of people all over the world, and I just take them through the process. They describe what it feels like. You get to see the visual. And what's most important, I think, is you begin to understand that every human body will tremor differently simply because we all hold patterns and we've all had different experiences of tension throughout our whole lives. So the tremor mechanism will follow your pattern. And it, mm. sometimes it may look similar to mine and sometimes it'll look completely different than mine. Mm. And what sort, in general, what sort of time commitment should somebody think about giving in order to get the most out of it? Well, the I tell people at the very beginning, only tremor for 15 minutes, that's it because I'm trying to help them learn um, how much can they do um, with, without it being too much or too little. So if they start at a low uh, uh, rate, like 15 minutes, and then they say, well, that felt really good. I wish I could have done it longer. 
So they say, well, go ahead and increase it to 20 and then to 25. Or sometimes you might say, I don't feel like tremoring at all, or five minutes felt exhausting and that was enough. So we, again, we have to learn our rhythm rather than use a recipe. See, and that's what people are so mm -hmm. used to. How many times do I do this push-up or this sit-up? Or how many times do I do this or that? I'm saying, try to learn how to follow the natural rhythm in your body. It'll give you the time frame mm -hmm. itself, see? So that's what I tell people just to be safe for themselves. Just start at a low uh, number of minutes and increase. You, if you get good at this, um, usually what you do, this is what I do. This is my natural I tremor for about 10 minutes just as I wake up in bed. I, I immediately activate the tremor mechanism. I tremor for 10 minutes. It really starts to refresh me. And so then I'm done for the day. I might tremor in the middle of the day just if you know, something happens or I feel stress. But then again, I tremor for 10 minutes at nighttime. So just as I lay down in bed, I activate the tremors. I tremor for 10 minutes. It helps my body calm down. So if you could find that rhythm, you, can, you don't need a lot of time to do this because it's deeply effective. And it's really resetting both the nervous system, calming it down, and the muscle tissue, relaxing it. And that's all you need to go to sleep or to feel refreshed. Mm. And, and it's... Um... It, you know, it's interesting that what you're what you're telling people is like don't don't look to for a formula because that's just more control, right? When your body's leading and you're following, then it knows, and you and I don't. Yeah, when we look for a formula, that's the clear indicator that it's the ego trying to take control of the situation, and this whole process is exactly the opposite put the ego on vacation somewhere and just let your body do it because it will tell you, it will give you sensations whether it wants to tremor longer or shorter. And all you have to do is feel the sensation. But if you're using ego, you'll miss the body's sort of communication to you. Right. Now, is there any degree at the beginning, at least, of sort of discipline or willpower Right, to, well, to make sure that you're, you know, you're doing it at all if it feels weird or uncomfortable. Yeah, at the beginning, there's a complication there because they're starting with their ego and they're starting with using general trainings they've been taught in high school, how to play sports, how to control your body, um, mostly how to control things. So you've got this ego that's sort of instructing the body what to do to get it to tremor. But here's the trick. Once the body tremors, you can watch TV or do whatever you want to do. Get the ego completely out of the way because now the body is controlling the communication and telling the ego what feels good or doesn't feel good. And what it's like, how will you know this? You are in control of an out of control experience because hmm. the, the ego is not creating the tremor. That doesn't happen at the ego level. It happens at a very primitive part of the brain. So all of a sudden you're laying there and your ego is watching your body saying, holy cow, it's tremoring. What's going on? I'm not doing this. It's doing it. And that's the beginning of the fun communication between the ego uh, familiar with always controlling the body. And finally, the body saying, wait, I can control some things too and we'll still be safe. So that's where the dialogue mm. occurs. Because mm. I think about you know people I know who are very upset that they have an eye twitch for example, yeah. or, or like little muscles jumping in the arm. From your understanding, I mean, I mean, there could be lots of different reasons, but from your understanding, that could be a perfectly benign body signal. Yeah. Well, see, that's what I think we have to give um, um, a consciousness to. Could this be purely simply benign rather than every twitch that we have in our body because it's out of our control is something... Uh, disturbed or damaged or neurologically um, uh, um, upset inside our structure. Some of the twitching, like I said, you go to a, on a roller coaster, your body's going to tremor out of playful fear. You're both safe and in danger at the same time on a roller coaster. And you feel it, see, mm. and your body gets all excited and it tremors. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually very healthy and fun to play with. So we have to teach people how here's our biggest thing. We have to destigmatize 
and change the current narrative or paradigm of tremoring. We have to help people see this is not just positive, but it could actually potentially be quite growthful for us. Hmm. Well, it's funny because like, you know, we also live in a culture in which there's a tremendous amount of drug addiction, where, which is, you know, people seeking experiences of transcendence of the ego, right? right. So if I get drunk, I get to be out of control in, in a socially acceptable way, even if I'm violent or, or right. you know, unlawful, there's still like ego, oh, he's a dr you know, drunk, as opposed right. to I'm a perfectly normal human being who happens to be in the, you know, in the, thro in the throes of, of some bodily experience that I'm not controlling. Yeah, I think that's perfect. We're always responding to the impulse of freedom. I want to let go. I want to jump off a cliff into a spring. You see all <laughs> these young kids doing all these exceptionally freeing things. And they say, oh, this feels wonderful. I can't go back and work nine to five in a job and have all that control. That's the natural organismic impulse. I want to both be free and let go of control. And I want to learn how to control when I need to. And moving back and forth is the healthiest state for the human organism. And that's why we have to use drugs because, or alcohol, because that's the socially acceptable, sad thing to say, socially acceptable way to do that. But the impulse is, I think, authentic. I want to let go of control. Mm. So for folks who are, are clinicians, who are um, psychotherapists or medical doctors or trying to help people you know, change habits and behaviors, do you have resources and trainings for them? Yeah, we have trainings all over the world because of COVID. Many of them now are online. You can do them over Zoom. Um, and you can see that from the official website, traumaprevention.com. But the thing I love is most of the people who are teaching TRE are in some sort of medical or clinical field from social work to yoga practitioners, to medical doctors, to even neurologists, because they did it for themselves first. They <coughs> excuse me, discovered this was remarkably unique and useful. And then they figured out how to incorporate it into their professions. And that I think is great. Mm. So what, what are you hopeful for, for the future? Because you've, you've been a lone voice about this for, for quite a while and things are starting to, you know, I've heard of you and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not that savvy. So, so <laughs> something, well, something's happening. Where, where, well, where do you see it going? You know, I'd like to see it going. Everybody wants to put it into the medical profession, and I'm not sure that's the right way. I want to see it spread as a grassroots um, technique so that we still keep it at the level where um, um, mothers can learn to help their children or single parents, whether it's a mother or father, could do it to reduce their own stress levels. Communities or support groups, they can do this all by themselves together. I'd rather see it spread at that grassroots level. Um, because then it, it's doing that in places like South America and Brazil, where they're more open and free. And they're doing TRE in the parks, where people just come by and they all tremor together as a way of reducing stress. And they're doing it in support groups that they have. There are women's groups that are doing it. They don't have any trainers or anybody. They just learned it themselves and they're doing it all themselves because they find it useful. I'd love to see it spread more that way. Um, which I think it is. It's initially a slower process, but it's working because it is even that process is getting it into the medical field. Mm. Uh, I'm suddenly thinking about like you mentioned earlier that ritualized, you know, ways of getting it in. I'm thinking about like Pentecostal churches and you know speaking in tongues and snake handling. Now I'm thinking about it in those neurophysiological terms. Yeah, well, the same thing. If you've ever watched, I used to go to gospel churches all the time when I was living in the in the South Bronx in New York, because that's what was there. So I loved going there. But people would tremor um, and they would shake and they would speak in tongues. And all of that was a process of letting go. But the tremoring itself, I could see that was a neurophysiological reaction, which 
they interpreted as the Holy Spirit, and I can't say that it wasn't, but I can say it was a sacred spirit of the human body that was mm. manifesting itself in terms of release and excitement and pleasure. And it was wonderful. So see, I think our body's been showing us this all along. Each culture has found a different way to put it within their cultural construct, but it's always been there. The human body wants excited freedom as much as it wants the ability to control itself. And this is one of those simple access routes for the body to have excited freedom. Mm, I love it. I love it. That's, I think it's a great place to, to close the conversation. Um, I'm so glad we finally got to do this. Where, where, where are you located? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Okay. Gotcha. And are you starting to travel again and do live workshops? I'm actually loving not traveling because I had done it so much that uh, I'm one of the few people who is delighted that I couldn't travel. I had to cancel like seven or eight international travels. And now that I've been home, I love it. I am doing a lot on the internet now, though. Um, okay. And honestly, quite effectively, too, mostly with the TRE community. So they already know how to tremor. And then I'm just guiding people through the process and um, doing individual sessions so that everybody can watch how I see the body and how I help the tremor mechanism to move through the body. Gotcha. So we're going to send people to traumaprevention.com. Is there a link there to your YouTube channel so we can just make um, it simple? No, I, I don't think there is actually. So they'd have to go to YouTube and type in David Berselli. Okay. And spell, spell your last name for us. B-E-R-C-E-L-I. Okay, one L. One L, yes. Okay, great. Now I'll, I'll include both of those in the show notes. Great. And uh, so thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to get back to this. I was doing yes, it a bit. Please when... do, Howie. I'm excited too. I want you to get back to this and start doing it. You're still going to get a lot of fun stuff out of it for yourself. I'm, I'm excited. I'm gonna, I, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to... I've got 15 minutes to my next call. So Great. We'll, we'll see what my body, where my body wants to go. There you go. Howie, it's good seeing you again. You too, David. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.